Hello viewers, thank you for joining me. The unexpected short manga series strikes again. All last year I stuck to shorter series on purpose. This year I felt ready to get invested in something longer again. So I walked into the bookstore, and I had three or four possible series in mind. But then I'd get over to their section on the shelf, and every single one was missing the first volume. And sure, I could have just ordered them to have later, but I was motivated to start something that day, so I decided to just go home with whatever looked interesting. That ended up being a four-volume series called A School Frozen in Time by Mizuki Sujimura, and the artwork is by Naoshi Arakawa, who you may recognize as the creator of Your Lion April. Just from a glance, there was a lot about this one that appealed to me. Mental health issues and a group of friends being forced to face their inner demons. And before we go any further, please be aware that this review will contain a lot of talk about suicide, as it's a topic at the very center of this story. Our tale begins with Seinan Academy reopening. The school's been closed for about two months, ever since one of the students killed themselves by jumping off the roof during the school festival. No note was found, so the media ended up blaming the usual culprits. They speculated that the student might have been bullied, or maybe the stress from the upcoming college entrance exams got to them. It being exam season does a lot to color the atmosphere of this story. Our eight main characters are all seniors as well, we're in the same class as the student who died, in fact, and are largely trying to focus on those upcoming tests as a distraction. The group of friends arrive at the school, and for a while it's just like old times, but they start to realize something's wrong. No one else is arriving, for one. The school is totally empty except for them. They try to leave, thinking maybe they got the wrong reopening day but the doors won't open. They try to throw a desk through the glass, but it doesn't leave a scratch. They get back to the classroom and realize all the clocks have stopped, and as they try to rationalize a crazy situation and talk it over, they realize another important piece to this mystery. None of them can remember who it was that committed suicide during the festival. And the final piece. There was a photo of their group of friends with their teacher on the teacher's desk when they first came in. It's missing now, but there were only seven kids in the photo. There are eight of them here now. As things get crazier, the theory becomes that this school is a separate world, that they're inside the mind of the dead student somehow, and that the dead student is one of them. This is another one with a lot of characters and it's about time we run through them. First is Takano, smart, athletic, and popular. The kind of character you'd expect to have a dark side lurking underneath it all. But the longer the series went on, the more it's reinforced that the reason he's so popular is just because he's genuinely kind, always putting others first. He walks to school that day with his childhood friend Mizuki, who felt kind of like your generic cute anime girl. She's sweet and kind of a klutz, but she also voices early on her concerns that everyone else thinks she's weak, and unfortunately, she's kind of right. Everyone tries to remain optimistic when she's around, but on more than one occasion, the others meet up without her to discuss their real thoughts on the situation, and how bad they think it'll get. Eight is a lot of main characters for a four-volume series, and I found myself grouping them into pairs. Next is the delinquent pair. Sugawara is actually coming back from a suspension on top of the school being closed, so he wasn't even at the festival that day. And Rika is the type to get in trouble just because she's very loud and outspoken. If anyone was going to cause problems, you'd expect it to be these two, but there was never an instance where the group turned on each other. Takano was kind of the golden boy of the group, so it was interesting to see that when even he had doubts, Sugawara was the one there to reassure him and motivate him to keep believing in everyone. Enrika may seem quick to snap, 
but it's just because she really wears her heart on her sleeve. You get her positive emotions just as strongly as her negative ones, and she is a very caring person. Keiko and Akihiko make up the serious pair. Keiko's built up a reputation with her classmates over the years for being cold and intimidating, but that's just a mask she puts on to hide her emotions. Watching her dad struggle to raise her by himself after her mom ran off with one of his co-workers has really affected her. Originally, she was staying strong for him, but somewhere along the way, she stopped feeling like she could show weakness or a softer side to anyone. I grew fond of Keiko by the end, but to be honest, Akihiko always felt like he was maybe just one character too many for the amount of time available to explore them all. Which is a shame, because you come to learn that he's particularly affected by this ordeal, having had a friend commit suicide in middle school as well. But up until the chapter that explores him in a little more depth, it was all too easy to forget Akihiko was there at all. He just had so little personality compared to the others. Last is the responsible pair, and to be honest, the only reason they're not as susceptible to being overlooked as Akihiko is just because they're two of the first characters the series explores, but they don't exactly have standout personalities either. Shimizu is top of the class academically, though she just barely beat out Takano for that spot, she certainly looks the part, but she's always felt a little out of place, struggling to make her resume look good, but without any real goals for the future. And Mitsuru is the timid one, trying to do the right thing, but easily pressured into Sugawara's bad ideas. This alternate mind world is in control every step of the way. Periodically, the clocks will start up again, the school bell will chime, and one of them will be faced with their darkest fears and insecurities. Mitsuru is the world's first target, and in a way, he's already living his nightmare. He knows he tends to fade into the crowd, and he's scared of being forgotten, much like they've all forgotten the student who died. He gets through his ordeal, but disappears from the world afterwards, leaving behind only a trail of blood and his cell phone, and leaving his friends a little more panicked, fearing that whoever they're being haunted by is out for revenge and wants the rest of them dead too. The story became a little formulaic after this. One by one, the kids would be drawn away from the rest of the group and have to face their fears, which sometimes presented themselves as a memory, sometimes it was a more on-the-nose evil twin version of that character, but I didn't really mind. We needed the one-on-one -on -one time with each of them. And I did mention that Akihiko never really grew on me, and Mitsuru felt a little bland even after we get to know him better, but for the most part, it worked, and getting a better view of who all these characters are deepened the mystery for me. We were working under the assumption that one of the kids trapped here is the one who committed suicide, so you almost can't help but start weighing them against each other, trying to determine who was overwhelmed enough by their problems to consider giving up. Mizuki's at a disadvantage there, simply because she fell apart the most publicly. She used to have another friend, who she saw more like a sister. She spiraled after that friend suddenly pushed her away one day, ultimately being diagnosed with some sort of panic disorder. Getting her back on her feet is actually what brought this group together. But, though they all care about Mizuki, this definitely affects the way they view her now, and she basically becomes the prime suspect. I found the conclusion to be a bit disappointing, but I'll save that for the little spoiler section at the end. For the most part, I enjoyed A School Frozen in Time. A lot of things about it spoke to me. I love the mystery element, the serious topics it's not afraid to tackle, and I'm generally a fan of the types of stories where everyone's got a dark past. But I also like a happy ending, so it was great to see the kids come together and support each other too. But I do have to admit that there were places where the friendship element fell a bit flat. I love mushy friendship stories, but I didn't always feel it here. 
Honestly, I wouldn't have guessed that they were meant to be such good friends until they started talking about how close they all were. I pegged them more as a group who were a little familiar with each other, because they're all in the same class, but who would only really get to know each other through this ordeal. With this many characters, I think it would have taken a much longer story to accomplish that, but unfortunately, the alternative is that the reader kind of has to just trust that they've had those good moments sometime in the past. All I can say is that it was hit or miss at best. Sometimes their talk of closeness was moving, sometimes it did feel like it was just talk. That said, I do think the good outweighs the disappointing, especially when a story is short, that tends to steal any arguments I may have had about it not being worth your time. I may not have loved the way it all played out, but it is a really interesting idea, and there were some great moments with the characters, if not the group as a whole. So yes, I recommend checking this one out, particularly because it seems to have been a little overlooked, and I feel like it should have gotten at least a little more attention. Now, there are a few spoilery things I want to talk about, the ending that I wasn't totally satisfied with, and a few moments that really impressed me. So, the safe part of the review ends here. After people start disappearing, Shimizu suggests another theory. She's read about phenomena where buses or airplanes have gone missing for months, only to reappear one day with its passengers bewildered that any time has passed. It gives them some hope that there's a way out, that maybe the people who are gone haven't been killed, but have just solved the puzzle of the world, and it affects the ones who are left when they encounter their own tests. Keiko's moment to shine was a real favorite of mine. She successfully faces down her inner demon, but then tells it that she doesn't want to leave. She's going to stay here and support her friends, make sure they all get out. But she's solved the puzzle and remembered the identity of the dead student, so she can't stay. Sometimes it felt like the series was going for a horror element, but this moment, watching Keiko get physically dragged away, was the one time it felt really chilling. Enrica's test was a great one, too. None of her friends know the depths of her problems either, and it's pretty bad. Her mom's never around, leaving Rika to turn to prostitution to support herself and her little sister, particularly to pay for her sister's asthma medication. She's about as overwhelmed as it gets, and she has considered ending her life before, something her friends aren't aware of and something she's surely not bringing up now that they're all under that suspicion. But when her inner demons take the form of her sister, accusing her of secretly wanting her gone, Rika only hesitates for a second. After all, she's faced this exact challenge before, and the answer she came to then was that she could never hurt Yumi like that, and furthermore, she didn't really want to die herself either, not when she's fought this hard to survive. Yumi and her friends are bright spots in her life, and she's another one who gets dragged out of this mind world, trying to stay with them. I really liked Keiko's story, but I think Rika's ended up moving me the most. And finally, we've arrived at the big spoilers. The very end. They definitely don't understand the mystery of this world right away, and their early theorizing doesn't get it all right either. It's not that they're in the mind of the dead student. Rather, this world was created by the turmoil one of them felt in the aftermath of that student's death. The turmoil that Mizuki felt because the dead student is the old friend who ditched her before she found this group, and it felt like everyone else was just a little too eager to move on and forget about her. And I didn't love this reveal. When Mizuki's first introduced, one of the very first things we learn about her is that she doesn't want everyone else to give her special treatment because they think she's fragile. I really wanted this story to be the one where she proved that she was stronger than they thought, or at least that she didn't come across like the only one who was irreparably damaged by her past traumas. But it ends with the group having to rescue her, and it's framed as a pretty triumphant moment, 
but I just wasn't feeling it. I mentioned that Takano felt a little too perfect at times. I was kind of hoping this would be the story where she saved him. That said, I do still recommend this one. There were some really great emotional character stories, and I do think there was more good than bad. Thank you for watching.